I played field hockey for two years. I've played lacrosse for three years, and I also managed boys wrestling. Hmm, that's a lot to do. Do you have yeah. time to um, have a job while you're doing this? Yeah, I try to manage my schoolwork and my after school work. In 2014, there was a viral podcast called Serial, and the host Sarah Koning dug deep into a case that happened in 1999 that involved a Korean American student, Hei Min Lee, who was murdered in Baltimore, Maryland. And the accused and convicted was her ex-boyfriend named Adnan Syed. But while digging into the little details, there were so many holes in this trial. The case was so bizarre because there are evidences, but there aren't evidences at the same time. Over 170 million people tuned into this podcast, and there's a lot of theories, a lot of people who believe the ex-boyfriend Anand is actually innocent. He's still behind bars over 20 years later since the murder of Heimin Lee. There's even an HP documentary and this was one of the most researched most time that I spent on a case ever and it took me days to go through pretty much all the timelines the evidences that I could find I don't know why but this case just hooked me in and I need your opinions and what you guys think and do you ultimately believe this is an innocent man behind bars or a master manipulator that manipulated millions of people and there is a new update in 2022 involving this case, so buckle up. So this is Hei Min Lee. She was a Korean American student born on October 15, 1980. She was born in South Korea, but she immigrated to Maryland, Baltimore with her family in 1992. She had a younger brother. She lived with her mother, grandparents, and I believe she had some aunts. So she lived in a pretty big household, a big Korean a strict household. And me same as well, being born in South Korea, immigrating to the US, not speaking English well, and living with a Korean family. Personally, it made me like an introvert but Heyman was an extrovert she had a lot of friends she was popular she was smart she played a lot of sports from field hockey to lacrosse she had a very healthy figure they described her as a tall girl she was bubbly she did intern she had a part-time job I mean she was literally an all-star she was also known to be very expressive especially in her diaries and this diary is going to be a very important key into this case because Technically, this is the only voice that we have left of Heyman. The police has released her diaries to the public and I will link down below if you want to read the whole thing. But as I read her diaries, it's really in a most respectful, positive way, like that cringy high school emotions. And you know what I'm talking about if you were in middle school and high school. She was very artistic, creative, and I just love the way she wrote her diaries. It was as if she was speaking to an audience, to someone else, almost like vlogging in 1999 except written down. She wrote about her exciting days at school, what she did, and of course like teenagers she wrote mostly about her love life. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit and now she was about 17, 18 years old and she met one of her first love in her life and his name was Adnan Syed. Adnan was a 17 year old popular, confident guy and he got along with everyone. He also got good grades. He was also a good son and never really got into any trouble. Adnan was born in America. He was American, but his family was from Pakistan. Because he was from a Muslim household, his family had a strict no girls, no dating rule. But of course, his friends say that he was just like a normal American student and just like a normal teenager, you do things outside of your family rules. He was dating around. I mean, he did smoke green stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Stay laid out and just had a lot of friends, but still was able to keep his good grades. I mean, he was kind of like a normal teenager. Both of them flirted a lot in school and they were sending each other like love notes and things like that. And Anand eventually ended up asking Hey out for the prom. Anand became the prom prince of that year. So you could see what kind of popular student he was. Prom night, they also had their first kiss and Hay wrote in her diary her emotions about how she felt about a nun and she wrote, I swear he's the sweetest guy. Let me tell you why. He was prom prince and Stephanie was prom princess and traditionally they're supposed to dance together to my song, Casey Jojo, all my life. I tried to act natural and jealous, but it did kind of bother me. 10 seconds later, guess who danced with me and not with Stephanie? A nun. Now, how can I not fall in love with this guy? 
side. She also goes on to write, I kept on falling deeper for him. He's the sweetest, coolest guy and he loves me. It was like fireworks. Everything clicked from that night and they started to date. Adnan sent roses during class to Hay, wrote more love letters to each other, and eventually, you know, they snuck out of the house, went to motels, you know, found secret places to make out. I mean, it was, it was like a really cute teenager love story. We see throughout Hay's diary of how she kind of grew a little bit frustrating of how she felt about the strict households. She wanted to meet their parents, go over each other's houses, and not really keep it a secret. They couldn't really even talk to each other on the phone comfortably at home. And back then, they didn't have cell phones like this. They had landline phones, like one or two phones in the house, and only one person could call at the same time. So you could literally sneak in to hear what your parents or your brother was saying on the phone. It seems like Kay told her family that Adnan was just a best friend, but they knew of his existence. According to Adnan, one night, Hay opened up to him and said that she was SA in South Korea when she was younger. And he believes that was like the one secret that she only told him about the really deepest secret that she had about her life and how bottled up sometimes she felt. Also in her diaries, she writes, I love him a lot, a lot. And you could just see her teenage love pouring into this relationship. Just like any relationship, it seems like they broke up and made up a couple times. And we're going to read some of the excerpts. And some people believe that this is one of the evidence that points Adnan to the murder. But if you just see it as a diary, in my opinion, I mean, it just seems like a teenage drama love saga that really any teenager really goes through. For example, Hay writes, I like him. No, I love him. Referring to Adnan. It's just all the things that stand in the middle, his religion and Muslim customs all are in the way. It irks me to know that I am against his religion. He called me a devil a few times. I knew he was only joking, but it's somewhat true. I hate that. It's like making him choose between me and his religion. The second thing is possessiveness. Independence, rather. I'm a very independent person. I rarely rely on my parents. Although I love him, it's not like I need him. I know I'll do just fine without him. I need time for myself and my friends other than him. How dare he get mad at me for planning to hang out with Aisha, her friend. The third thing is mind play. I've matured out of my jealous S. I don't get jealous over trying to get him jealous as a fool. Him trying to get me jealous is sick. A fool because I'll definitely lose him, me. I prefer a straight relationship that doesn't get into people mixed up just because he wanted to play mind games. The fourth thing is nothing because I do love him. And then fast forward a little bit, you can pause and read if you want. I, I can live without him, but I love him and want him with me. Please, Adnan, be patient with me, my love. On June 27, 98, she wrote, I love my baby so much, but to tell you the truth, I don't know just how much more of this depression I can take. It's not annoying, I'm not wanting attention nor much love from him. It's that I love him so much that it really hurts to see him hurt. And I don't know just how much more pain I can stand. But I sort of feel like he's moving away from me and I love him. But as long as I can, I'm going to stay with him, be there for him. So it goes kind of back and forth in some excerpts. And I do have to note that when I was reading this, you know, I'm trying to think of myself as a 17, 18 year old. And I know that even love life was so dramatic and sensitive and everything is dramatic when you're a teenager, right? So if I'm just reading the diary, it really seems like Hey was an expressive person going through different relationships, emotions, just like you do when you're at that age. And then there's an excerpt in July 98, which I thought was interesting that the podcast and the documentary did not read. It seemed like on the phone, Adnan and Hay were kind of arguing and she wrote, he said one thing that will always ink me. He said, you said that I can't fulfill you physically while well, you can't fulfill me emotionally. I just broke on that one. I don't understand why he said that. I was still loving without all the things he does for me. So a lot of people who have read this case in Hay's diary, people do kind of point to how religion, especially Adnan's religion, played a big role in their relationship. According to Hay's emotions, it seemed like she was really concerned about how she might be taking him away from his religion and his path in life. And she didn't want to do that. It seems like she wanted to be someone that can give unconditional love and love them for who they are and be okay even if the teenage drama saga might end one day. So we're gonna fast forward to December of 1998. According to the courts, they say that Hay and Adnan broke up officially in December. 
Although in her diaries as I've read, she never really wrote about them being officially broken up or being heartbroken. Really nothing about that. It seems like she just transitioned into meeting a new guy and his name was Don. He was a 22 year old blonde, tall, blue eyed boy that she really mesmerized about. They were co-workers and she had a part-time job at Lens Crafters. In her diary on December 6th, she explained about how she kept thinking of Dawn even though she still loves Adnan. She goes back and forth writing like a respectful cringy teenager like, I love him but I love him too, what do I do? But by the first week of January, Hay writes how she went on a date with Dawn and that he was such a gentleman down to earth and that she's falling in love with with him really quickly and deeply. So according to the classmates and friends, it seems like Hay and Anand were still like close friends and they were keeping this mutual respectful relationship even though they were seeing other people. On her last diary entry on January 12th, she went out on a date with Don and she wrote, I love him. I think I've met my soulmate. And this entry kind of put shivers down my spine because this was the last entry before she went missing. On January 13th, Hay told her friends that after school, she was going to pick up her cousin, then meet Dawn at the mall. School ended at 2.15. Something had to happen to Hay very shortly after the school ended because she did not show up to pick up her cousin. And nobody knows what happened to her during that short time because she was never seen again. So this is when the case officially starts because it gets really muddy and nobody seems to really remember exactly what happened. So according to Anand, it seems like he doesn't really have a clear memory of that day. But according to the information that we have, he went to his class then called a friend named Jay Wilds and he was going to lend him his car and his phone during lunch period. Anand then comes back to school around 1.27 p.m. Then supposedly he went to the library and met his friend Asia McLean and she remembers talking to Anand at around 2.15 to around 3.30 p.m. Anand then goes to track practice and after Jay picks Adnan up and goes to their friends Kathy's house. After school, the police officers call Adnan asking if he's seen Hay. He tells them that he was supposed to get a ride from her after school but he got detained at school but she probably got tired of waiting and left. Then by 8 p.m. Adnan goes to the evening prayers at the mosque. Again, this is the best timeline that we can get to Adnan's murky, cloudy memory because he does not remember really much of that day. And his explanation of possibly why he doesn't really remember that day was because to him this was a normal repetitive day. Also he was being asked what he did on January 13th specifically about six weeks after Hay went missing. So that's about a month later when someone is questioning you what you did on a specific day on a Wednesday January 13th. Try to remember your day to day hour by hour what you did. I mean it could be hard. I mean do you remember what you did? five weeks ago, specifically on a Wednesday. Do you remember your day-to-day, hour-by-hour? On February 9th, Heyman Lee's body was found in Leakin Park by a maintenance worker named Alonzo Sellers. He claims that he was going to take a quick pee in the woods and he thought that he seen a body and called 911. Lincoln Park is known to be kind of like a graveyard because a lot of homicide victims body has been found in these areas. Going to the autopsies and what we found about Hay's body. Hay was found buried in soil but not really that deep and this photo shows that you could see her feet and hair peeping out from the ground. They believe that she was facing down somewhere else and moved to that location after she has passed. There wasn't much clues found but they did find some red fibers that was found with her. There was also a rope and liquor bottle found in the area. It was ruled that Hay died by strangulation and was most likely killed near or at her car. On February 12th, three days later, police received two anonymous phone calls and it was a man with an Asian accent and, and this phone call told the police to look at Adnan as a possible suspect. Now Asian accent is a little broad. Are they talking about East Asian or are they talking about a different type of Asian from a different region area? But this is pretty broad, an Asian accent man. On February 28th, 1999, Adnan is arrested at his home at just 17 years old and he was being charged of 
first degree murder. Adnan denied and kept his innocence, saying that he had nothing to do with Hayes' disappearance or murder. But one of the problem with Adnan's story was that his memory was muddy. He couldn't remember any alibis or really point to where he was that day. Again, was it because someone was telling you to remember something six weeks ago on a Wednesday? Or was it because he was guilty? Police looked into Adnan's cell phone records and his phone was relatively new. He only got this about two days before he went missing. One of the person that police would find of significance is his friend Jay Wilds. So Jay Wilds was another student at school, but he was in the graduating class, so he wasn't attending school full time like Adnan and Hay and everyone else was. I'm not really too sure about the school thing or if he's graduated or back then, you didn't have to attend full school. But according to classmates, it seemed like Jay and Adnan were kind of surface friends. They weren't like close friends. But at least Adnan was comfortable with Jay to let him borrow his car and phone sometimes. According to friends, Jay was someone who liked to listen to rock, had funky hair colors, and some people say that he was a nice kid. But then some people say that, oh, there was a shady vibe to Jay. One of his co-workers back when they were working at an adult shop together, he says that Jay was the type to exaggerate and show off a lot, but he wasn't the character to be involved in like very high bad stuff. So here's Jay's version of what happened. Now Jay's story of what happened the day that Hay went missing changes multiple times. So here's the first interview with the police. Around 10.45, Jay gets a call from Adnan. Adnan then comes to Jay's house and he confesses that he's going to kill Hay. According to Jay, apparently Adnan has been planning this weeks prior. Adnan agrees to allow Jay to borrow his car and phone while he was at school. Jay then drops Adnan off at school. Jay then goes to friend Jen's house and hangs out there. Then sometime around, he gets a call from Adnan to come and meet him up. That's when around 4 p.m. Adnan shows Hay's body in the trunk of her car, then drops Adnan at track practice. Then Jay picks him up once again after track. Around 7.30, they go to Leakin Park and Jay helps Adnan dig a hole. Adnan then buries the body, then ditches Hay's car again in a residential parking lot. Then they dump the shovel and Hay's belonging at Westview Mall dumping spot. That day, Jay tells his friend Jen that Adnan killed Hay and that he helped with digging the hole. So now, of course, police are like, they got a strong witness. This, this is someone that actually helped the suspect to bury the body. I mean, this is one of the strongest evidence that you can have when someone confesses that they, they were there. I don't know at what exact date, but Jay also led the police to where Hay's car was. So Jay knew where Hay's car was all this time. Jay was called in for about second, third interview, and it seems like his story started to change a little bit. Now, of course, his story of him helping out Adnan didn't change, but there were a lot more details added on to these interviews. And one thing that didn't make sense was Jay's version of story of where he was with Adnan throughout the whole day, and they compared that to Adnan's cell phone records. And it seems like the cell phone records of when the phone pinged did not quite match Jay's story of where they were. So some things that changed in these interviews later on was where Adnan showed Jay the body of Hay. It was also later on when he added that he went to their friend's Kathy's house to hang out at night. He also added saying that Jen and him went to the mall at night to clean his fingerprints off the shovels and throw away the clothes in a dumpster to get rid of the evidence, which was not said in the first interview. Friend Jen testified that indeed Jay did tell her that he was helping out to dump the body and went with him to throw away his clothes and to supposedly clean off the fingerprints. Another friend, Kathy, says that she does remember seeing Jay and Anon come to her house at one point and she didn't know Anon at all. She only knew Jay. She confesses and says that both of them were acting a little strange and Anon was saying, what am I going to tell them? And shortly after that, they just left. And according to the police and Kathy, this was January 13th. Another coworker, Josh, whom this was not, I believe, in the original court, but he came later on to the podcast. He claims that Jay told him, I helped dump a body. 
And he remembers Jay being just so scared of just like going in and out of their workplace and he believed that like a van that was far away could be a van to come and you know threaten him. But Josh doesn't understand why Jay would even tell him anything like this because why would you tell your coworker or someone that you're not close with that you helped dump a body. That is a weird thing to confess to just anyone around you. I don't know if you've ever done something like that, would you go around telling your friends and coworkers that you did something like that? It is it's strange. Or was Jay freaking out and didn't know what to do and he felt so guilty that he had to tell some people. But nevertheless, we could see that Jay was acting very strange and very nervous around his coworkers and friends. Now, Anand's friends and classmates were so shocked that Anand would even be arrested because they never saw Anand as someone that could do this. Some of the friends, classmates, actually went to the principal's office to tell them, like, they got the wrong guy. This is this is not Anand. He's the nicest kid on a roll. Like, there's no way he could have done this. So people were wondering, how could someone like this go from zero to a hundred. I mean, he did not have any prior convictions or got into trouble at all. So let's talk about some of the forensic evidences. Hayes' car was found in a residential parking lot, which was mostly grass. And back then, police believed that the car was there sitting there for six weeks and that it wasn't moved, of course, according to Jay's story. Forensic team tested out later in 2016 during the HBO documentary to see if it was possible for a car to be sitting there for six weeks because according to the photo it seems like the grass color hasn't changed enough for the car to have been just sitting there. According to the team, the grass has to change in colors due to weather and time. Also, according to the neighbors, if there was a car sitting there for even more than a couple of days, they would call the police and have it towed. Now this testing was done later and it was not done in 1989, but later we will find out that it seems like according to the experts, the car could not have sat there for straight six weeks. And they did this with testing of the certain plantation or grass that was there. So it is a mystery and it's not proven yet if the car actually stepped there for weeks at a time. Police and forensic experts searched and stripped everything they can about Adnan from his house, car, soil samples, and nothing was found that linked Adnan to the Lincoln Park area. They also did not find any match of that red fiber that was found with Hay to Adnan. Also, Jay claimed that he saw Hay's body pretzeled up in Hay's car, and there was no testing done in Hay's car to actually prove that her body was there. There was also fingerprints that was found on the car rear that did not match Jay, Adnan, or Hay, but no other analysis was done. There was also a lot of DNA testing they could have done, but that was never tested. And one of the reason could be because the police and prosecutors already had a credible witness, someone that helped bury the body. They didn't seem the need to go into DNA testing, and also it wasn't as advanced at that time. Now, other than Jay's witness testimony, there was no other physical evidences that could link Adnan to Hayes' murder. Okay, let's go to the trial. So during the trial, the prosecutors argued why Adnan has done this. They claimed that he was angry about the breakup and that he was jealous of her new boyfriend, Don, and for her moving on without telling him about the new guy. They claimed that Adnan lived a double life and said that his life back at home was to be a kind, religious kid who listened to everything the parents did, but outside, he smoked smoked, he dated girls, and he did everything that he wasn't supposed to and was a bad kid. They also tried to portray that his pride was destroyed and it was like an honor thing for him based on his religion and culture that he just cannot have this female break his heart like that. The defense argued that there was no physical evidence pointing to Adnan as a killer and that Jay's story had multiple changes and it wasn't reliable. The main thing with the prosecutor was that Jay's story matched the cell phone tower records. Remember, Jay and Adnan on the 13th were together most of the time and supposedly one of the ping matched the Lincoln Park area, especially around 7 p.m. when prosecutors argued that Hayes' body was buried. 
Now, of course, it was multiple versions, couple versions later when Jay's story did match the pings of Anand's phone calls. Another thing was that Anand insisted that he didn't have his phone around 3.30 p.m. on January 13th and that Jay had his phone because he was not allowed to bring phone to school and obviously that's why he left his phone in the car for Jay to use for a couple hours. But according to the phone logs, at 3.32 p.m. from Anand's phone, there was an outgoing call to a girl named Anisha. Anisha was a girl whom only Adnan knew. He was kind of like the girl that he was flirting with. But according to Adnan, Adnan should not have his phone with him because he was at school. But according to Jay, they were both together and Jay says that he remembers Adnan calling up a girl and saying, yo, say hey to my friend, a girl that I'm talking to. And this girl, Anisha, does remember at one point when Adnan called her and made her speak with a friend named Jay. So there are witnesses that match Jay's story. According to Adnan, he does not remember this and he shouldn't have his phone. So some people argued that was this a butt dial. But this phone call was supposedly over two minutes long. How can a butt dial be that long? Adnan argued that it could have gone into voice messaging, but Anisha claimed that she never had a voice messaging system at the time for that specific phone. So according to the prosecutors, I mean, why would Jay in his right mind ever lie about this of helping out a potential murder? Like why would he tell his friend Jen at the day of when Hay went missing that yo, I helped dump a body. It's also weird that later on we find out that Jay told multiple versions of the story and multiple versions of why Anand was threatening Jay to different people. And one of them was that Anand was threatening Jay that he's going to call the police that Jay has possession of drugs, green stuff, if he does not help with the burial. There's also another version that apparently Anand was threatening Jay that Anand is going to hurt Jay's girlfriend if he did not help. Now Jay's girlfriend Christina and Adnan were both best friends or close friends themselves. So Jay was really afraid that Adnan would hurt Christina as well. Now let's go to the trials. The family of Adnan believe that Adnan's ethnicity had also something to do with the trial. For example, during the bail hearing, the defense argued that Adnan has so much support from the community and they're all gonna help him to look after him. And if they can't pay the bail, like there's multiple people who are gonna put their houses down. So like, there's no way he's gonna run away. He's at low risk. But prosecutors argued that because he has such a big community from the Muslim community, that they are willing to help him flee back to Pakistan if in case he wants to flee. They were also comparing to other cases involving a Pakistani man who killed someone, fled back to Pakistan and they can't extradite him anymore. And basically argued that he's at high risk of fleeing the country. Ultimately, the judges took the process prosecutor story and denied him bail. Eventually at the trials, Adnan was found guilty of Hayes' murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Now Jay only got two years of probation and no jail time. And the judge said that he felt like he showed sympathy. And a lot of people have a little bit of hard time understanding Jay's trial because technically he helped him bury the body. But for whatever reason, Adnan did not testify in Jay's hearing. It is also very odd that the prosecutors in Jay's trial provided Jay with the lawyer, which is unheard of because you're trying to prosecute someone, provide a lawyer for someone you're trying to prosecute seems out of the norm. So a lot of people call Jay's trial like too good to be true. So let's talk about a lot of the holes and possible other suspects in this case. And what ultimately make this case so fascinating to so many people? Let's talk about Don. Again, Don was a 22 year old new boyfriend friend or new date of Hay. Don claimed that he was at work the day she went missing and came home around 7 p.m. Now he did have an alibi that he was at work and he did punch in into work according to the evidences. But a lot of people have a problem that Don's alibi is his mother because the lens crafter he was working at was owned by his family. Another weird information was that a friend of Hay went to Don to talk about where Hay was and if Don knew anything 
anything and they had a seven hour conversation and the friend remembers that it was so weird that Don actually was kind of trying to flirt with the friend or that he was trying to come and see her later on and the friend just thought that that was weird like your friend just went missing and are you kind of hitting on me of course that could be just the perspective of the friend I mean maybe Don was just trying to be overly nice and she took that as flirting who knows? A coworker also remembers that he still Don with scratches and bandages in his hands during the time around when Hay went missing. But nothing was followed up after about this. Let's talk about Alonzo, the man who actually found Hay's body. A lot of people found Alonzo to be a bit strange because he actually had a lot of criminal history. He was also known to streak a lot in public. Streaking Go look it up, what it is. He had multiple arrests and I believe one of them included stalking. The day when he found the body, he said he was drinking and driving and he had to make a pit stop. Number one, people find it odd that he went a little extra farther than a normal person would if you wanted to just take a quick pee. Number two, he was drinking. So we see some of the photos, some people claim that like there's no way you were able to just notice it because it was pretty well camouflaged into the dirt and leaves. But I personally saw the photos and unless it was dark at night, I think it is possible to notice it. Also, some people went back to the exact location where the body was and they don't believe that it is too far from where the roads are. It is plausible that, you know, this person really just came across it. Or was it an unknown person that has not been identified yet? Who was that anonymous call, the man with an Asian accent that called for a tip? Let's talk about Jay. Friends from high school say that the two you aren't really close and they don't understand how someone like Adnan would even ask someone like Jay to help bury a body. Friends also again say that Jay was the kind of person to talk a lot about BS and like over exaggerate things. But again the question is why would Jay make this up? Why would the day that Hay went missing that he would tell his friends that he had something to do with this like unless it actually happened? How did Jay know where Hay's car was? And that's the one thing that people who believe Anand is innocent can't get over. How did Jay know where the car was? But here are the holes in the story. Remember, Jay's original story did not match the cell phone records and it was only until multiple interviews later where his whereabouts did match the records. A theory by some of the people who dug deep into this was that did the police somehow plant this in Jay's mind? Because the police found inconsistencies in Jay's story and the records that they have that they just really needed to make the story make sense so they made him go over and over and over again and to tweak a lot of the details. Also, there's a theory that maybe the cops kind of threatened Jay saying that they're gonna get him in trouble for the green stuff, possession of drugs, or if Jay helped him get the story straight, promise him to get a very lenient sentence. The witness Asia, who saw Adnan the day and the time that prosecutors argued that Hay was murdered, she claimed that she was never called to the witness stand and the police never talked to her. But she could have been the key witness to turning this whole timeline around. So why did even Adnan's lawyer never call Asia to be the witness? But also, why does Adnan not remember anything that happened in January 13? Why is his memory so murky? Like if it was me being accused of murdering somebody and I got the call that day asking where my ex-girlfriend was, wouldn't that be a significant day that you want to really, really think hard to remember? And some people also say that, well, these kids were also smoking and maybe that kind of affected a lot of the memories and thinking and judgments. But that's a whole nother like topic, so. I mean, what use would Jay have of making up the story? Is he trying to cover up for somebody totally else? And that he needed to tell a different version of the story from the first and second and third interview to try and protect himself for the involvement of Hayes murder. You might make certain details up in order to protect yourself so that you are as least involved as you can than you actually are. 
Let's talk about Krista. So later on during the documentary, obviously like 16 years later since this has happened, the private investigator showed her her school's schedule and it showed that she actually had class that day so that she couldn't have been home on the 13th. Her class was ending at 9.30 p.m. So she had to be home after that. And according to Jay, Adnan and him went to Krista's house during the time that Krista was supposed to have class. She does claim that she didn't really remember if that day when they came over to her house was exactly the 13th but that the detectives reminded her of that date so now like 20 years later she claims that you know she really doesn't know like what happened like i was supposed to have class that day she didn't miss classes so was it really the 13th she saw adnan and jay at her house or was it another day that she got mixed up with? Also, we now find that there were some errors in the police report, such as one typo on the cell records versus the police report that could change the tower's records of where they were at that location. Also, a new key information from AT&T papers in 1999. It clearly states that only outgoing calls are accurate in location and incoming calls are not. And most of the evidence that the prosecutors presented were incoming calls. So that could mean that where they were could have been actually far off. Sarah Koning, the podcast serial, she met up with Jay in 2014 to try and talk about the case. And the podcast crew says that they only met Jay about 20 minutes at his home. And when they asked about the case, Jay immediately got very angry. Quote, that Adnan will not man up to what he did but no other real details were given. But we do have to note that anyone that testifies against a criminal, they could be in danger by the criminal later on if they ever get out or by the family or whoever that they might be backed up by. So a lot of witnesses or people who testify against them don't like to come forward and talk about like a traumatic experience in their life. So Jay did an interview with the Intercept Media after the Serial podcast was released and according to him, he didn't want to give any formal interviews, especially with the podcast, because he wants to protect his family. He's married with kids now and his involvement in something like this led him to have stalkers come to his home, annoy his wife and kids and he just doesn't feel safe. He went on to also explain why his story was inconsistent and it was because at first he didn't want to comply completely with the police knowing that he would get his friends like Jen, Kathy, and even his grandmother involved. Also, according to Jay, he says that he saw the body near his grandmother's house. He didn't want the police coming to his home, which he also said that he had a lot of green stuff in the house and didn't want to get in trouble for that as well. He was simply trying to protect the people around him and when police told him that his drug stuff will not affect his outcome, that that's when he gave his full story. He also said that he's willing to come and give any additional statements, but only if Hay's family needed it. To him, this case is not an entertainment. It's a dark past that he doesn't want to constantly bring up. I'll leave a link down below to the full interview if you guys want to read it. The cell phone expert who testified in 1999 came forward and said that he was not made aware of the note from AT&T, the accuracy of the incoming and outgoing calls. He also stated that his testimony would have been different if he was made aware of this by the prosecutors. Finally, in 2016, Adnan have won a retrial. Of course, Hamas family were fighting back hard, knowing the person that they believe is a killer of their own daughter could be out of prison. They finally did a DNA testing after all these years and found that no DNA of Adnan was found in Hay's body, fingernails, and other swabs. Not only Adnan, but no other person's DNA was found. The only DNA they found was in a rope that was found near Hay's body, but this DNA was an unknown person in the police database, which means that this person never gave their DNA or possibly would have been arrested. Adnan was also given a plea deal in 2016, but he denied this. So if you take the plea deal, you're admitting guilt saying that you've done this, but in exchange you serve for a little bit more time in jail and you'll be released. But if you deny this plea deal, it means that you can stay in prison for life as originally sentenced. In 2019, ultimately, Adnan was denied a new trial. Adnan is now 40 years old and he has spent more than half of his life in prison. And recently this year, not too long ago, the court approved for new DNA testings, hoping that it will shed some new light into Adnan's case.
There is one possible theory that serial podcasts kind of talked about that there was one serial killer that was out in prison only 13 days before he went missing. And this guy was a criminal named Robert. He also killed another Asian woman only a couple days after he went missing, but he died couple years back so if the dna matches this guy i mean that could be a long stretch theory for now i mean my question is even if jay's stories changed multiple times and unreliable how did he know where his car was i mean just like how serial podcast ended i mean could it be even possible what are the coincidences of how unlucky adnan got if he's really innocent what are the coincidences that he let jay borrow his car and phone that day that he butt down one of his friends at 3 32 p.m. I mean Jay didn't know her only Adnan did. Coincidence that Jay just decided to make this up. I mean I mean how unlucky and so much things could fit into that story if you really did not do it you know. But ultimately I do agree with a lot of people that there are no physical evidences and this is why it's so important to have physical evidence in court because humans could lie and physical evidences directly point and put the piece together. So the fact that he's spending life in prison with no physical evidences is not fair and I do think that he deserves a new trial. I know we focus so much on the witnesses and the suspect but we have to note that Heyman Lee was a beautiful, beautiful, living, real girl. And to the family of Heyman Lee, their life stopped over 20 years ago. And they will never see her again. Let me know what you guys have thought about this case and see you guys in my next video. This is named one of the darkest twisted cases in America, the Killer's Hall siblings. It's almost as if one was an angel sibling and a devil sibling. And at the end, evil took over. But does Andrew deserve a second chance at life? And how scary even siblings can be? Have you ever checked your siblings last night? Just kidding. This case is really famous, so you guys might have heard of this, but the Tsuh family was an immigrant from Korea in the 70s. They grew up from a very traditional parents. If you guys are from another country and if you guys have traditional parents, you do know how sometimes traditional, especially Asian parents could be. They could be very strict. I didn't even know my necklace was falling up. Why didn't you all tell me? So supposedly the father, Mr. Tsu, was a traditional one, probably can be seen as pretty scary to the kids. They say he was in the military and that he came from an elite family, I think meaning at least a family who had a pretty good amount of money back then. So the Tsu family had first two kids, one the eldest son and a daughter. Now, unfortunately, the eldest son had a tragic accident. Apparently he fell from somewhere and he ended up dying. A lot of traditional families and still today they put a lot of their household trust to the firstborn son because son was the one who was supposed to carry on their traditions, their cultures, their pretty much everything about their household family. Now that their one and only beloved first son passed away and only had a daughter, father Mr. Seo really demanded his wife to give him a son or they were just gonna get a divorce and the marriage was over. Now they say by this time Miss Seo was in her early 40s and she was kind of iffy if she could get pregnant again or she could even be a good mother being a little bit an older woman but because she was so determined to really stick with her family and her husband she did everything from fertility treatments fertility drugs to get pregnant and voila nine months later they had their second son Andrew was born and surprisingly he apparently had the same birthmark on the same spot as their first son Pyeongchul their family really believed that he was their eldest son reborn so after Andrew was born and they they decide to immigrate to the US. As you could see, it felt like the woman in the family, the daughter, wasn't as appreciated by their traditional father. Now, ever since young, Catherine and Andrew both helped their parents to translate and to pretty much settle in America. Now, ever since young, Catherine, the daughter, was always very different from her brother, Andrew. Andrew was the one who always obeyed his parents, always helped his parents out at their dry cleaning shop, and Andrew always, even till this day, said that family obedience was drilled into his head ever since he was young and he was okay with it because that was just his personality. He wanted to help out his parents and he always never questioned and whatever the parents told him to do, he just did. But Catherine was kind of the rebellious one. She always questioned things. She didn't want to do things that their parents always told 
him to. And she really started to dislike this traditional Korean family that she had. She sometimes would lie, run away, pretty much went everything against the traditional parents. Now, whenever Catherine did rebel, father was old tradition, so he would spank and punish the kids. Now, apparently there was this one incident that we believe Catherine and the father just snapped and something went really bad. So one day, I believe Catherine was under 16. She was a young teenager. The father found out that she was dating and seeing other boys. And according to Andrew, apparently there was this Latino guy on the phone asking his father, where is your daughter? And because of this, his father got so angry. The fact that she was seeing boys at such a young age. And according to the father, this guy was super disrespectful to the father saying, where's your daughter? So the father and Catherine was bickering back and forth, yelling at each other, just having this huge fight. And apparently the father was kind of slapping Catherine around, again, spanking the kids for her behavior. And this is when Catherine just had enough and he scratched the father's shirt. He was bleeding in his chest apparently. And and again, this was just what got the father just, just at the end of his edge. So apparently he got a bottle of oil, put it on Catherine and himself and tried to lit the fire and said, this is the day we're going to die together. For whatever reason, this lighter would not light. And that's when the mother came in and just separated them both and stopped the fight. And this was the point that Catherine and her father just completely stopped talking to each other and their trust was gone. So according to the experts, they believe that this was when the grudge against her father and her family in the traditional ways and everything about herself started to grow inside in a very negative, dark way. Of course, in the young Catherine's eyes, maybe she was doing her best. She was trying her best, wanted to be liked, but the harsh love by her parents made her see the world in a different light. Maybe she really didn't know what love was. Now fast forward a little bit, Andrew was 11 and Catherine was about 16 years old and the father, Mr. So, was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Andrew was there next to his bed caring for his father and he was also in the local Korean American newspapers for being such a great son. Catherine, on the other hand, never came to see her father until he passed away. Apparently on the deathbed of her father in the hospital, she just came saw and left. Experts believe that Catherine, instead of feeling remorse that her father passed away, she was finally free from someone that always tried to suppress her. Now, after the father died, Miss Ho went on to work at a dry cleaners and Andrew was also always there to help his mother. Catherine also, on the other hand, was really never there at the dry cleaners and she was still again coming home whenever she wanted. There was no curfew for her and she just always did what she wanted to do. Although her mother knew that she could not control Catherine. She had that soft spot for her kids and she would still gave Catherine allowance to whenever she went out, whenever she asked for money. And Andrew says that he always felt like Catherine was just using his mother's kindness. Catherine was also known to be very promiscuous around guys according to the people that who have seen her and encountered her. She was kind of hitting on older guys. And one day when she was attending a health fitness club, she met a man named Robert. Now Robert was, around seven to eight years older than her and she was 16 but i guess back then this whole thing was okay so catherine and robert started to date each other and something clicked about them they really liked each other not long after that 13 year old andrew came home and there was police surrounding his house he was only 13 years old, he didn't know what was happening, and Robert and Catherine came up to him and explained that his mother was murdered at her dry cleaners. According to the forensics, someone was standing on top of her, literally stabbing her about, I believe, 27 times. 13 year old, you guys, that is a kid. And to not have your parents anymore, that is going to affect you in a very, very deep way. Now in this murder case, again, Miss Ho was stabbed multiple times, her wallet was missing, and the cash register was open. But there was only $100 in the cash register, so for someone to have brutally murdered her for just $100 of cash, it just absolutely did not make sense, but there was no forensic evidence that they could collect to determine who did this. And a lot of people at first, even police, believe that it was just a robbery gone bad. Of course, Andrew, being very angry and very upset, he told Robert and Catherine that, you know, we have to find this robber. Like, we have to see what happened. We have to bring justice to mom. And apparently, Robert and Catherine said they will never find the robber. It's too difficult. And they both agreed saying that we should just move 
on. Which is not the reaction you would expect if your mother has been brutally murdered to just move on. I mean, how would have 13 year old Andrew felt even hearing that from his own sister? The only family member now he had was his sister. Again, he still has this obedience toward his family. So now he has to abide by his sister. He had a very rocky relationship with his sister after their parents passed away, fighting with his sister often as she accused him of bringing girls over the house. And Andrew even once ran away from the house because his sister was accusing him for things that he didn't do. But he soon realized that without his sister, there was nothing that he could do. He was only 13 years old. Now, because of the mother's death, they had an $800,000 in inheritance from the insurance. Now apparently back then, the male in the family got the insurance money. So it was actually Andrew who was supposed to take care of this $800,000. But because Andrew was a younger one and he was a minor, now it was his sister Catherine who took control of this insurance money. Robert moved into the Tull family's house and Andrew says he did feel awkward that they were getting rid of their parents' room and living a new life there. But he was still grateful that his sister had someone to lean on now. And now Robert became this male role model for Andrew. Robert was a man who actually didn't have even a college degree. And according to his family and friends, he didn't have much things going on until Catherine fixed him up in hopes that he will once become a successful businessman one day. Catherine bought him a new set of thousand dollars worth of clothes, cars, and they even started a business together. They even bought a new house and apparently Catherine bought everything new for the house. Of course, where did they get this money from? It was probably the insurance money from their mother. Catherine herself also fixed herself up by wearing expensive clothes and makeup that made her look impeccable according to her friends. According to a lot of people, she was the person that was able to achieve anything that she wanted and anything that she put her mind to, it came true. Now, Catherine did want her little brother to become a leader, to do well in school, to become a strong person, and that's what Andrew went to do. Andrew joined the football team and he became a class president and he was being an outgoing star in the school, even though he was one of the only few Asians. He became a valedictorian and later even got a full scholarship to college. So it seemed like even for Andrew, he technically did what he wanted. He really exceeded in classes and I'm sure it made his parents really happy. Catherine and Robert started business. They were in a new house and luxury clothing and items. I mean, what could go wrong? Now it was one hot summer day when Andrew says that he came home and he saw Robert out in the garage drinking and pretty much drunk. Robert in his drunk state started to talk about his sister in front of Andrew and started to pretty much talk bad about her. Robert started saying, I did all this for her, but she goes out and cheats on me. The only reason why she deals with me is because she knows all my secrets and I know her secrets. Now it was predicted that Andrew and Catherine always fought about money and their business. But it is interesting and keep in mind he said that she knows my secrets and I know her secrets. Now not long after this, one day Catherine called Andrew to complain about how Rob was going crazy breaking windows and was hitting her. So Andrew came home and everybody was having this huge fight and at this day apparently Robert had even a gun and they were just going back and forth yelling bickering about how they ruined each other's life although they were living in this new house and luxury items. But according to Andrew, this was when he lost all respect for Rob. Rob was someone that he really looked up to ever since his parents died, but to have a gun in his hands, always being drunk, and apparently according to Catherine, that Rob was behaving very inappropriate towards her, just got Andrew to be really pissed off. Now, even after all this family drama, Andrew finally went off to college, and it seems like he was having a great time there. Now, during his college, college days, he was saying that Catherine would occasionally call Andrew to always talk about Rob. So you could tell, little by little, Catherine started feeding these things, feeding her dislike about Rob to her own brother. It's like, oh my god, leave your brother alone. Why would you do that to your brother? Like if I did not like someone, I'll keep it to myself or tell my girlfriends. Like why would I tell my brother that's in college having the best time of his life? But anyway, it was one break when Andrew decided to come back home for a little while before he had to go back to school. One day, Catherine and Andrew decided to go on this little lunch and Catherine had something to confess to Andrew. Now, Catherine decided to confess what really happened on the night their mother passed away. 
According to Catherine, Robert was desperate for money because he had a lot of debt. And Catherine and Robert was having a difficult time always fighting about money and she told Robert that everything will be fine one day when her mother dies because they have this big inheritance money. Again, $800,000, that's a lot of money. According to her words, I didn't ask Robert to but he killed our mother for money. It was probably Catherine's idea in the first place. And she's kind of sugarcoating this, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, Andrew's response was, let's call the police. What are you waiting for? We know the perpetrator. We know who did this. We now have to get justice. But Catherine responded, if you call the police, they will think I was the accomplice. And if he goes, I go. You have to get rid of him for mom. What kind of sister? instructs their own brother to kill. Now this is how the theory goes. The theory goes that Rob couldn't cut off his relationship with Catherine because she was paying for everything. And that Catherine couldn't let go of him because he would have turned to the police to tell their dirty little secret of what they did to their mother. Hence why she wanted to get her brother to kill instead of getting the police involved. Now some believe that it was actually Catherine that killed their mother and she's trying to frame Robert into everything. But in my personal opinion, let me know what your opinion is, but I personally don't think Catherine was the one who actually physically killed the mother. I personally believe Catherine is more the manipulative mind killer meaning she uses other people and manipulates using her beauty, her attractiveness to get other people to do what she wants. Just to mind you guys, these are all theories. It does not mean that Robert was the actual murder of Miss Ha. There's no solid evidence to point to this. And who knows, Catherine could have hired a hitman. The truth, we will just never know. But of course, at this point, Andrew was just so angry at Robert and that Kathy, Catherine, was the only family member that Andrew had left. He had no one else left, no one else to look for. And who are you going to believe? Of course, your one and only family member, your sister. This is when Catherine handed over the gun to Andrew. And Andrew was only 19 at this time, 19, going to college. So Kathy and Andrew finally came up with a plan on how to get rid of Rob. So Catherine called Rob on the phone saying that her car broke down and that he needed to come and help her fix it. So Robert decided to come to the house and help Catherine. Now this is a little bit of extra information, but according to the police, Rob was on the line with his other girlfriend while talking to Catherine. Parent Catherine and Rob had an open relationship. So finally, Rob came over to the garage thinking that he was going to help his fiance and that's when Andrew who was hiding inside the garage pulled the trigger and killed Robert. He says that at that moment he pulled the trigger his thoughts went back to when he was 13 years old cleaning up his own mother's blood at the dry cleaners and Rob was standing there besides him so chill telling Andrew this is how you clean up blood so casually. Also that promise that he made to his father at his deathbed about how he was gonna take care of his mother forever also flashed across his head. All of this led him to pull the trigger. Fast forward, eventually Andrew was caught by the police at the airport. When he was caught, he was carrying $65,000 in Robert's ID. He finally admitted to killing Robert himself and the reason and the motive behind it was to make his sister happy. Now at court, apparently Andrew showed no remorse to the family and this was one of the reasons why the judge put him to a hundred year sentence. Now during Catherine's trials, apparently Catherine fled. She was on the runaway and she fled to Hawaii. She had different names she was going by, different looks. And she was even on America's Most Wanted until she eventually turned herself to the police claiming that she was innocent. But at the end, of course, Kathy was convicted to life in prison. She was accused of manipulating her own brother and possibly her own fiance into killing her own family. It is also rumored that one of the biggest reasons why Kathy wanted to get rid of Rob was for his insurance money. Apparently he had a $250,000 insurance. Catherine also showed no remorse in court. Now today, Andrew is in his, I believe his 40s. And according to Andrew, he says that it's sad even in the Bible and the old times, it was eye for an eye. But in today's society, when you kill a monster, you also become a monster. I was really convinced that Robert killed my mother. But of course, according to the judges and the law and Robert's family, he was a willing participant in this crime. Now, unfortunately, his mother's murder case at her dry cleaners is still an unsolved 
unsolved mystery today. It never went to court and still to this day, we technically don't know who actually did it. And here is a little cherry to the top of this crazy story. Andrew says that in prison, he sent a letter to his sisters saying that it's okay, we're still siblings, we're in this together, we're family. And Catherine's response to Andrew was, don't ever talk to me again. I don't have a brother. That is the last slap in the face, especially for someone like Andrew who had no family. He even lost a sister doing the dirty deed for her. So the question that a lot of people have and that people have been raising is, should Andrew get a second chance at life? Now, because of this crazy story and kind of where Andrew could have come from and why he did the things that he did, he did get a lawyer and attorney and try to lesser his sentence so that he could be free one day. The lesser sentence, I believe, was denied, but Andrew is eligible for parole in 2034. My little personal two cents is that, according to, of course, Andrew's statements, and if this everything that Andrew says is true and honest, I do believe that Andrew should get a second chance at life. I would also like to ask, do you think Catherine turned up this way because of her strict parents? And what are the effects of having certain parents that give harsh punishments? Halloween night is one of the biggest holidays celebrated now worldwide with costume parties, spooky events, or originally a day where people believed the souls of the dead returned and you'd wear costumes to, to ward off the spirits. On Halloween night of 2001, this Korean student attending State College in Pennsylvania goes missing with absolutely no trades. Not one single clue left behind. It's as if she vanished like a ghost. The only potential break in the case would be a tip by a criminal who claimed he knew who took her and killed her. But that has its own twist of the story leading to a crazy chase of finding out the truth about Cindy. But it still leaves her case to be unsolved and we hope that someone will come forward 22 years later with possible new information. And if it wasn't Halloween night, would Cindy still be here today? Someone out there absolutely knows what happened to this girl. This case has been long forgotten, gone cold, and now we have the power of social media. So I really hope that you guys could share the story, listen to the whole video and hear out who she was and why this case is just so crazy and fascinating at the same time. Cindy Song, or her Korean name Song Hyun Chung, was born on February 25th, 1980. And back in 2001, she was just 21 years old. She was born and grew up in South Korea until 1995. At the age of 15, she moved to Virginia, USA to live with her relatives to study English and attend high school. Cindy would go on to graduate high school with good grades and attend Pennsylvania State University. She was 5 foot 1, 110 pounds. She had long black hair, brown eyes, has a Pisces sign tattoo on the back below the waistline. She would have two part-time jobs and one of them was working at a Korean restaurant. She also attended full-time school. She was dedicated in studying. She loved being athletic. She did tennis and track. She loved music, photography, and art. And friends called her the fierce, independent woman. She majored in art and she actually frequently wrote her feelings and her love for you know photography, art, and things like that in her blog. I'm not sure what blog looked like back in 2001 and what platform she used. The only early on vlog sites that I can remember is Zanga. I'm not sure if Zanga was like what she wrote in. Now there are infos out there that Cindy did have a boyfriend and I believe this was one of her first serious relationship and I believe he was another Asian American named Richard. They've been dating and living together in an apartment but apparently in September 2001 Richard had broken up with Cindy. She needed to find a new roommate. She was heartbroken and she was actually going to therapy and taking some anxiety medicines. I don't know due to the breakup or she was getting this before, but you know, she was getting the help that she needed to kind of get over those bumps in her life. Because her boyfriend left, she needed to get a new roommate and she did and she met Catherine. Catherine was a new female roommate and they've been living just about a month together. So now it's October 31st, Halloween day. And of course, college girls and boys, you have to party. Cindy is a senior in college. She just turned 21 that year. And of course, like 
you have to like drink and have fun. Although Halloween on this particular year was on a Wednesday and they said that, you know, she doesn't party on the weekdays because she's so busy, but this was a particular night that she wanted to go out with her friends. And there was apparently a costume party at a club called Players Nightclub on College Avenue. And she decided to attend here with Stacy Park and Lisa Kim, whom she considered as very close friends. Cindy would dress as a cute bunny girl in bunny ears, white tennis skirt, a tail, brown boots. But her friends say that her version of the bunny girl wasn't the sexy bunny girl. It was a very cute, more of the modest version. Her friends also remember that she did have fake lashes on, and this is going to be a very important information in just a bit. Now, the three friends decide to stay out late. Of course, no one wants to come home like their parents would like you to at 11 a.m. on Halloween day. Now, little story here. I personally love Halloween, but ever since last year and just what's happening throughout the world, I'm very careful on Halloween day just because... Last year on Halloween, I was in LA out with my friend. We were in this alleyway making TikTok videos. Yes, that video. That's when we had three big ass, like tall men that are masked so we couldn't see their faces and they had a baseball bat. Like all of them had baseball bats. Now technically, because it's Halloween, people are masked and you think it's a costume. Now those three guys came up to us and they just said nothing, no expression, and they were just literally grabbing their bats and like looking at us up and down. And then that's when I quickly realized, oh my god, these guys are up to no good. And it made me realize, oh my god, Halloween, people could literally have weapons and you would just think it's a joke. Where it made me realize Halloween day is a day that you really have to be careful because people are going to take advantage of people wearing costume, of parties. So anyway, Cindy and her two friends went to the nightclub. They stayed till 2 a.m. and decided to go to another house party. They moved to their friend's apartment, ate, partied a little more, and at 4 a.m., their friends say that they dropped Cindy off in front of her apartment building. Now, her close friends say that they saw her walk up the stairs to her apartment, and that's when they left. But of course, who would have known that that would be the last time they would ever see her again? And from here is when things get so strange and spooky. The next day, Catherine comes back to their apartment. Now, Catherine is Cindy's roommate and she did not stay there because she was at her relative and she came back the next day. So she realized that Cindy's room was locked. She remembers that specifically. So she thought that maybe Cindy went to class, went to work or whatever. They did have things planned that day. So now it's Thursday, November 1st. They were supposed to hang out after school that night, but Cindy never came back. Cindy would not show up to her classes on Friday as well. Now it's Saturday and friends did not think much of it until she did not show up for her shift at the Korean restaurant. This is when the friends knew that they had to report it to the police and something might be very wrong. Unfortunately, because it was a Saturday, they had to wait two more days for the police to show up for the missing person's report. On November 5th, Monday, five days since she technically disappeared, police showed up to Cindy's apartment and started to try and notice if there were any suspicions. There was no forced entry, nothing broken, and no particular odd suspicions that they can find. They did find Cindy's fake lashes that she wore that day that was on the top of her sink. This meant that she did come inside, take off her lashes, and then something happened after. Along with that, they found her school backpack and cell phone, which was left. And the only thing that seemed to be missing was her purse, which had her license, credit cards, and apartment keys inside. Her outfit she wore that day was also not found, so we believe that she was missing with the outfit on and she didn't change her clothes yet for some reason. A little comment here, when girls take lashes off as a woman who wears makeup, it means you're done for the day. Trust me, like lashes are one of the first things that women take off because it's uncomfortable. And when you take your lashes off, like your eyeliner is like messed up and like you just know you're done. You're not ready to go out anymore, party, nothing. Like, so at least coming from me with this lashes explanation, it, it really seemed like she wanted to go to sleep and call it a night. Now, strangely enough, when when they looked into her phone, there was no other incoming or outgoing calls from her cell phone, meaning that nobody called her up saying that, hey, come outside, come for another party. 
or her calling someone and trying to meet someone up. I mean, you would think that if someone that she knew was outside the door, they would call her cell phone and she would physically come outside. So nothing, no incoming or outgoing calls, no suspicious emails, no one threatening her, fight, drama, nothing. Now they did check her credit card. Apparently there was a 24 hour little supermarket across from the streets of where they were living. It was about like a, from what I saw on the map, it was about like a five minute walk still. And maybe she got home and she wanted to do a quick errand. Maybe she wanted to get something, some water or whatever that she just needed at that moment that she couldn't wait till the morning and decide to have a quick run to the store. They did check her credit card statements and there was nothing. So she did not spend any of the money now does she have cash maybe but they possibly wanted to get the cctv footage that could have been near that store but unfortunately by then the footages had been overwritten by other footages and this was 2001 which is very common they would probably use tapes and tapes do not run too long so a lot of the times they would just use the same tape over and over again so no footages of cindy no purchases made so it made people believe that if she wanted to go to the store, she did not make it there. Now, according to the police, this is not a crime scene because this is just a missing person's report. There was no blood, no body, no suspicions or break-ins to the house. So it was kind of limited what the police could do. As of right now, it seems like she literally just walked out and vanished like a ghost. The second thing would be that did Cindy run away on her own? Again, maybe she was drinking, things got into her head about the breakup and she was taking anxiety medications and, and things just blew up. But her friends say that that is not likely of Cindy because she was planning ahead. Again, they had a Britney Spears concert to go to. She also had a new computer that was to be delivered on November 6th. She was about to hang out with Catherine the next day. She also applied for internship. She had two part-time jobs and she was not the type of girl just to drop everything and leave without notice. Friends also say, you know, that Halloween party, she was having an amazing fun time. Now, some people do say that, you know, when it comes to depression and anxiety, people, you know, hide things from others, which is possible. But again, according to friends and what she left behind, it just doesn't seem like she would have vanished on her own. She left the door locked to her room for whatever reason, which I thought it was a little odd because because I mean, she knew Catherine wasn't home. I don't think she was gonna leave for that long. Again, she took her lashes off. She did not take her phone, which could have indicated that she was just about to, you know, take a quick walk and come back. Although it's 4 a.m., I would not leave anywhere without my phone. Um, but again, it's 2001. People had different behaviors with phones back then. And it seems like they never found her bunny ears. So it meant that she took that with her, which I also found it a little odd. Headbands have a little bit of a tension pull right here near the ears at least to me and it just gives me a headache wearing it for too long so i don't like headbands so the fact that she didn't even take those ears off and left somewhere also leaves so much imagination again coming from a woman myself I, the headband will be the first thing i take off so i mean did someone knock on the door and tell her to come out for a second another thing which seemed a little stressed but the only thing that police found was her diaries and in her diaries police could see that she wrote about experimental drugs like marijuana and ecstasy now these were just party drugs and her friends claimed that she was not a normal drug user at all this is just something that she tried once or twice at parties and she just wrote about it so it made police question was she intoxicated with drugs that specific day it's halloween police did look into all the friends and the ex-boyfriend and they did see absolute no suspicions with them and ruled them out as people who might be possibly involved Again, we can't call them suspects because legally this is not a crime. So how much they interviewed them, not sure. But from every article I found, the police claimed that they were all ruled out. After Cindy was reported missing, the only tip that they got was from a woman. A witness was walking her dog. Says, Few days after Halloween, she saw a woman who looked like Cindy in Chinatown in Philadelphia, which was 200 miles away, by the way. A woman yelled for help and was being forced inside a car. She claimed that she tried to say something to the man, but he yelled at her and told her to go away. She did report this to the police, but according to them, the witness changed the details of the story so much that they do not believe that this was Cindy and this could be just a possibly a hoax. And unfortunately, this was in Chinatown 
town as well, so you could mistake in any young lady for Cindy. There was a montage of the possible suspect, but absolute no leads. Police tried to search nearby parks, the dumpsters, and even used helicopters. Any place that she could be and nothing. Cindy's family back in Korea was alerted and Cindy's mother and her brother came and flew all the way to try and help with the search. I want to jot a little note here. When the family arrived to the US, it's been about two months since Cindy had been missing. Because of that, no one had been paying the rent to Cindy's apartment. Therefore, I'm not sure if the landlord or whoever came and actually changed the locks to Cindy's room so that so the, fam so the family claimed that they couldn't even go inside her apartment when they arrived. So apparently, Cindy's family came to the apartment and cleaned a lot of the things up in her apartment. And this made police feel like, you know, if there was any evidence or anything left behind, you know, they can't use it anymore because it's all gone. It's cleaned up. Now, coming from an Asian, like Asian parents clean up their children, no matter if they're adults or not, they clean up their room because they care about them. And especially to Cindy's parents, like they hope that she would come back, come back to her clean apartment. And by then, I mean, I think it's been a couple weeks since Cindy's parents came. I mean, by then the police should have gotten any evidence if it, they were in the apartment. Any fingerprints or evidence might be gone by then anyway. So Cindy's parents hired a lawyer. They went around campus, they gathered, students after students to help find Cindy. And they felt like police weren't doing much. Apparently there was only just one lead detective in this case. Three months after her disappearance, family and the groups of people dedicated to look for Cindy held a press conference, including their lawyer. And they criticized the police department for not doing enough. But there were talks about race, like were they kind of, you know, disregarding this case because she is not American. I mean, technically she's an immigrant. But again, according to the police, because there was was no crime scene, no body, there was not much that the police can do without court approval. So they can't get warrants. The next thing police could do, because there was literally nothing to go off of, they used a psychic. The psychic was named Carla Barron and she appeared on multiple TV shows and she does do crime cases like this. So Carla would be brought to take around, I believe the campus and around where she lived. And according to her quote, she said, when this first came up, I seen three to four men that were with Cindy, so I knew that this was abduction and I knew it was sexual in nature. And I'm just seeing her being loaded into this vehicle. Then I see it wasn't very long before she had crossed over. Now, unfortunately, there was no names, no faces, no leading to the body. So unfortunately, police couldn't even really use this for it to lead to anything as well. And in 2002, her story was featured in Lifetime's Unsolved Mystery documentary, which exposed her to a lot of people. But this documentary is 20 years old and I tried to find it everywhere and I can't watch it. I, I, it's not online. So the question remained, why did Cindy lock her door? Why did she still have her bunny ears on? Where was she going? Was she going to get food? Where was Cindy? It seemed like her case was going cold until 2003. Could this be the biggest breakthrough or false hope in Cindy's case? And the story is just about to get even more bizarre and twisted from here, you guys. Just try to stay with me. So in June 2003, a man named Paul Weekly came forward to police saying that he had some tips some juicy stories to confess to and wanted to be an informant for the police. Now, Paul Weekly is a career criminal. He was already facing felony burglary charges. He was about to face many years in jail and in exchange for possible reduction in sentence, he was going to become an informant for the police. So this guy, Paul, claimed that he had an accomplice named Hugo Selinski. Hugo Selinski was also another career criminal and he was just even a bigger bad boy than Paul. Hugo was in trouble with the law since his youth from burglary, assaults, I mean, you name it. Now, Hugo was already wanted by the police because he was a prison escaper. Yes, there was even a documentary about Hugo because his prison escape was crazy. And somehow only within a few days of being in prison for a burglary charge, he somehow found a loose nail in the prison's window. 
Within few days, he was able to gather 11 bedsheets and somehow was able to get the prison window open with these loose nails. He literally made a Rapunzel escape. He literally tied 11 bedsheets and that's how he got down from this prison. He even brought a flimsy mattress topper thing in order to put over the spikes to finally escape. I mean, they describe this, this guy as fearless. He doesn't care. He will do what he puts his mind to. And another prisoner actually tried to escape right after Hugo and he lost his grips and became permanently paralyzed, leaving Hugo to be very lucky that he was even able to do this. So Paul weakly claimed that Hugo had another accomplice named Michael Kurowski. Michael Kurowski was a pharmacist who was running also an illegal prescription drug ring. According to Paul, you know, Hugo and Michael was out on a Halloween night and they were in their car and they abducted someone that looked like a prostitute. They took her into their car, brought them all the way to Hugo's house, which apparently was about two hours away from, from where Cindy was. They assaulted her, kept her in a vault for a couple days, and then finally killed her. Now, why would a pharmacist like Michael be even involved with someone like Hugo? Allegedly, again, Michael was running this illegal prescription drug ring and he considered Hugo to be one of his best buddies. Then Paul claims that Hugo killed Michael because Hugo was angry that Michael kept Cindy's bunny ears as a souvenir you know, like a sick souvenir that killers do. And that Hugo did not want any evidences left and he got mad at Michael and decided to kill Michael and his girlfriend. Michael's girlfriend was Tammy Fassett. Now, Paul didn't specifically say that this lady was Cindy, but the story really matched up with who Cindy was. Paul would go on to say that Hugo was responsible for up to 13 people's death and police went and raided Hugo's large like mansion-like property and found 12 of the bodies buried in his backyard. Police did do a DNA test and two of the bodies actually turned out to be Michael and Tammy. So police did find Paul's story to be somewhat credible because everything else he said seemed to match up. But the other bodies, according to the police, were other drug dealers. And unfortunately, none of them, the 12 bodies, were Cindy. So then Paul would go to change his stories multiple times. He would now claim that Hugo killed Michael because he wanted to steal Michael's stash of cash. Again, Michael was running a big illegal prescription thing and he had made about a million dollars doing this and they wanted a cut of it. Hugo apparently threatened and tortured Michael and Tammy to tell them where the cash was and eventually ended up killing them. Michael actually before when he went missing, he pled guilty to the prescription drug ring and he was about to serve time in prison. That's when he went missing. So police throughout this whole time thought that Michael was on the run, but they found out that he was actually dead. So in 2015, actually after multiple changes, Paul pleads guilty to Michael's death as well, meaning that Paul was involved in the killing of Michael and Tammy. Paul then goes on to confess that he changed his stories and blamed it on other people to isolate himself from the murders. And I believe for the exchange, Paul did not receive the death penalty and he just got life in prison. Police also found in Paul's computers articles downloaded about Cindy's case. So they actually believe that Paul guy was just bluffing. And basically, he also was involved in Michael's murder, but he wanted to make up a story to blame it on Hugo all on his own. Paul's story with Cindy being involved kind of doesn't make sense. They lived pretty far from where Cindy was. And the whole stealing the bunny ears and then murdering his friend for that, I mean, it didn't really make that much sense. Before he confessed to Michael's murder, he also had this version where he said that Michael liked Asian women and that's the reason why they kidnapped. So the story kept changing and eventually he pled guilty to Michael's murder. I mean, criminals like him really never tell the full version of the story in order to really isolate themselves. And unless there's a benefit of telling the full honest story, they're not going to do that. I personally now, after reading all of this, say no, but police are not letting go the possible theory that Hugo was involved, but there was absolute no evidence in any connection to Hugo, Paul, Michael being involved in Cindy's disappearance. And apparently Michael is has died, so there's no way that he could speak up as well. Now, when Hugo was caught in 2003, where he actually turned himself to the police, it's crazy, but he had a lot of female fans. There were female fans making songs about Hugo. 
and how good looking he was, how charismatic, his smile, his eyes, he is definitely the bad boy that people like. Hugo and Paul are now almost 50 years old today and serving life in prison for crimes not related to Cindy. And now we have this whole possible false hope for the family that we know what happened to Cindy. So this leads to the ultimate conclusion. We're on base one again. What happened to Cindy? Where did she go? Who took her? Cindy will be 42 years of age today and people wonder, is she still alive somewhere? Was she trafficked? Could she still be out there? Did she really just walk out on her own and, and something happened to her self-harm? Where was she going? I mean, we don't even know if that 24-hour store theory is even correct because she was never found there anyway. Is there a knock on the door from someone? Did she open the door? Did someone snatch her right then and there? If she needed something at the store, what did she need that she just could not wait till the morning? Or could Hugo and Paul really be telling the truth and, and they're just hiding the real truth of what happened? to Cindy. My heart just breaks for Cindy's parents and family because they have no answer 21 years later and they weren't even from America. They don't even speak the language or the culture barriers and things like that. So according to this article, the family actually claimed that the police did not do a thorough search. According to them, they actually don't believe that they searched her phone and emails thorough enough, which could be possible. But I do believe that police would have said something if they did find something of significance. My camera battery ran out, so I'm switching to my phone, but there's not a lot of people talking about Cindy and there are a few YouTubers who made video about this. That's how I knew from Diva Jessica and a few of the YouTube videos. So now that we have power of social media, I am hoping that we'll reach out to a new audience, revamp these cases so we can let the family and the victim know that they're not forgotten. Her friends are now all grown up in their 40s. I'm sure they have their own life now. Even the detective who was was working on this case he's retired now and the creepy thing is someone knows out there what happened to cindy and they could be walking around knowing and and keeping this a deep secret if any of you guys live in pennsylvania state or have heard about this case or live in the united states in general and know any information let's bring some awareness to cindy and hopefully we'll be able to find an answer for the family one day thank you so much for watching and see you in my next video Today's case, they call this like the 2.0 version of the Conrad, Roy, and Michelle Carter's case. If you guys remember the bizarre texting case, the trial of Michelle Carter, the girlfriend Michelle was convicted of involuntary manslaughter, pretty much planning and influencing her boyfriend to self-harm himself. Of course, that case is not directly related or similar in details to today's case, but the talk about how young people are texting and using technology to manipulating someone to do something very dangerous is a very hot topic. So this is In Young Yu, and she was a 21-year-old Boston College student who was studying economics. Her classmates from, I believe, middle school or high school days describe her as very shy, a little quiet. You know, she seems to be very well behaved, and I believe she grew up or graduated school from Washington. She was born in South Korea, but was naturalized to the U.S. citizenship later on during her youth. And this is Alexander Artula, who was 22 years old, also attending the same Boston College. These two met at Boston College and they decided to start dating. They became official, they were madly in love, and they dated for about a year and a half. Unfortunately, not a lot of information about their private life is released to the internet, so I'm not really sure in detail more about who they were, what kind of students they were, their personalities, so a lot of those are not available. But just based on these pictures, it seems like they're a very youthful, lovely couple. And their smile seems pretty genuine. So when they started dating back in about 2017 or 2018, it seems like they were doing pretty fine until you found out that her boyfriend, Artura, met his ex-girlfriend without telling her. Now, this ex-girlfriend was also in the same school, Boston College, and supposedly, allegedly, Artura was still communicating and meeting his ex-girlfriend. I don't know how many occasions or any more detail about this, but ever since then, Inyoung started to become very, according to the prosecutors, abusive. Their friends also claimed that they saw the toxic behaviors between this relationship, but again, not much information of what they exactly saw is released. Things started to intensify two months before the incidents of this case. 
For two months, the couple exchanged over 75,000 texts and 47,000 of them came from Inyoung. To put into perspective, that's about almost 800 texts per day, exactly 786, or about 1,200 texts between the two. They were also set to FaceTime each other very frequently as well, but you guys, 800 texts is a lot. They literally had to be talking to each other and texting every single hour constantly for that to like amount to that amount. Some people called it like a full-time job to text that much to someone. I mean, low key, you could call that as like a heavy addiction to your phone or communicating through texting. You and Artura also used apps to track each other's GPS. So as long as you turn on the GPS and some kind of app, you could see each other where they are. So in a way, you could tell these couple was literally madly in love with each other or their love was intensified greatly. But I know that sometimes when you're young, you have this feeling of literally wanting to be so attached to someone where you want to know where they are exactly. They have to respond to you to every communications and it can get very overwhelming without you realizing. This is just a little side note, but in my personal opinion, especially when it comes to relationships and dating privacy is very important when it comes to any relationship whether it's friends family because when you start to share literally everything about someone you get into this very vulnerable position and they can have a very very strong impact on your thoughts on your behaviors so you might start to lose a sense of being an individual and thinking for yourself and everything revolves around someone else and not you because when you trust someone you're giving them permissions to do also good in your life such as Heal, but also bad in your life where it's easier to damage manipulate and control you in a negative way so fast forward from what we only know from what the DA released to the public prosecutor said in quote she physically verbally and psychologically abused or during the year and a half relationship and that the abuse intensified in the days and hours leading to his death they also described it as a power dynamic in the relationship one of the witnesses I believe which was the friends who witnessed their relationships said Atula felt trapped like he had no option but to stay with her because her life was literally in his hands. So I'm going to be reading some of the excerpts from Atura's diary and the conversations between you and Atura because it can be very sad and triggering for some people so if you don't want to read the text messages you can skip this part. On March 26, 2019 in Atura's journal diary he writes, she attacks my self-worth. Whenever we argue it always reverts back to the past and how I lied and hurt her before and how she doesn't believe that it won't happen again. Then I, when I agree to end it because she says she's done with me because I'm a horrible retard, that it is just a burden on everyone's life. She in turn threatens to self-harm herself because of me. March 31st, Artura to you in a text. I asked you to stop so many times. You don't even know what's going on in my head right now. I really can't talk to you. I'm breaking down and I'm scared. But if you want to keep on me, you have every right to. I'm having the worst anxiety attack of my life and the voices are so loud. And they all have your voice, the person I love the most in the world. They're all telling me to self-harm. And so did you. I want you and the voices to stop. To stop telling me how worthless and pathetic I am and how much I deserve to. April 1st, Artura to you. You own me, all of me, only you. You have complete control of me emotionally and physically and you dictate my happiness. You owning all of me includes everything. What I think, what I feel, you own all of that. Your happiness is my priority. Inyang, please, I'll give you whatever you want. I'll leave this earth. Just please don't do anything. Don't hurt yourself anymore. So please, I'll get out of your life. I'll go if you want. I'll erase myself from this world, it'll probably be better off, and I don't have anything anymore anyways, I don't have you. Whatever will make you happy. And here are some texts from you to Artura. You're gonna literally see all of them. A main graduation ceremony. You piece of Go die in hell, you deserve to go kill yourself. There is a main ceremony with all of you and you lie and say you won't see them all. Can you go harm yourself, leave me the alone? And if you don't die, I'm gonna 
self-harm myself. You can pause the video and read the rest of it if you want. So according to the prosecutors, there were thousands of messages like this. They didn't say hundreds, they said thousands of messages of you sending to Rotura to self-harm himself. Explosive, very toxic, manipulative behavior. So in the messages we read that Artura described that he heard voices and no one knows for sure, at least it wasn't released, that if he meant voices literally, like he'd been dealing with something serious mentally, um, it could be psychosis, hallucinations, schizophrenia, whatever it might be as an example. Or did he say this just as a metaphor to describe just how he was feeling at that time? No one knows, but, but based on these messages and what he said about how you was controlling him mentally and physically, Prosecutors were able to use us and say that you exactly knew about Atura's degrading depression and mental health. It was also reported in December 2018. Atura texted some of his friends saying, I'm worried, I need help, I can't do this alone. I'm not sure what the context of this text was or exactly what he was referring to, but his friends called the school's emergency health center hotline to help him. Um, but they were told that Atura was not in immediate danger. But unfortunately, because he was never diagnosed before, no one really knows the extent to what he was going through. Finally, on May 19th, Artula and his family, including his brother, drove from New Jersey where they were living to the Boston College as he was set to graduate on May 20th, the very next day. It was reported that on the night of 19th, he spent the night with you at her dorm. Now, no one knows what really happened that night, what kind of conversation the two might have had, because on May 20th, the very next morning, only 90 minutes before for his graduation, Atula went to the car garage and self-harmed himself, leading to his death. Just minutes before his graduation. No one knows except possibly the couple themselves if something happened that night that could have all of a sudden triggered something in Artula or if it was possibly something that was building up to that moment. Somewhere along the timeline, when you realize what he was about to do, she sends texts and calls to Artula to plead him to stop. Now here are the texts between the couple of the day before the incident. Artula says goodbye. You says stop. You'll have everything once I'm gone. Please stop. Don't leave me like that if you ever love me. If, if you want to show me you love me, stop. I did love you, just not well enough. I'm begging you, please. I'm almost there, please. Where are you? Please, please, please. So somewhere along, Ertula did turn on his GPS location, and that's how Inyoung was able to track where he was. She, I believe, took an Uber, and she also sent the location to Ertula's brother. According to the BuzzFeed news, she arrived three minutes before Ertula passed away. Ultimately, the prosecutors saw you as the initiator, the person that created a dangerous situation for Artula that ultimately led to his death and tried to charge her with involuntary manslaughter. Now, this is not the same thing as murder. Involuntary manslaughter, I believe, is the unintentional killing of another person. During the trial, the district attorney said, Miss Yu was aware of his spiraling depression and suicidal thoughts brought on by her abuse. Instead of helping, she kept it to herself when it came to his conditions. Prosecutors also claimed that he had no history of mental health problems before his relationship with you. So here is where the tricky argument comes in, and I'm only talking about what the defense said as well. We can all probably agree that morally, what In Young did just based on the text was absolutely wrong. Sending hate and threats constantly, almost 800 texts a day, that is extreme. I mean, how would that affect someone when you're constantly bombarded with these messages, especially from someone that you trust and call your girlfriend? But is what she did criminal? Is what she did going against the law? And should someone be convicted for sending messages? So defense argued that these were two individuals in a consensual relationship that yes, became toxic, but the responsibility was on both sides. Quote, these two young individuals were very needy emotionally and were involved in a relationship that became a toxic blend of fear, anger, need, and love. 
Their argument was also that texting was a form of free speech. So some people were saying that, you know, people say things out of anger or when they're upset, you know, you may send some nasty messages to your friends or your family or your loved ones. And a lot of people say, whatever you say through those texts and DMs should be freedom of speech. You should be free to express your feelings, rather you angry, happy, or sad. Also, some argue that Alex could have done something else, such as blocking you and seeking professional help. That the individual holds the responsibility to help oneself. By law, generally, people have no duty to help or rescue another person. There's no law that says, you have to help someone if someone is in a life or death situation. Again, again, morally that might be the right thing to do, but it's not criminal if you decide not to for whatever reason. It also sparked the question, could texting be dangerous? I mean, they are just technically words. They're just technically pixels on our screen. But do we have the responsibility to hold our action through texting? Would things happen different if the conversation was majority over physical communication rather than through our phones? So the question is, how much can texting another person affect one's judgment? Is it really safe to say that we know 100% of the psychology and how much phones affect us if technically phones are still very new? It hasn't been around more than what? 15 years? I mean, phones have been around longer than that, but just the term of texting, DMing one each other, like in a mass communication scale, it hasn't been that long. So it is now up to the judge to decide is what she did ultimately led to his passing? And was what she sent to Atula that morning just before the incident enough proof that she did try to stop him? The defense did fight for the case to be dismissed and very recently, In Young took the plea deal which was 10 years probation with 30 months of suspended jail time. Meaning that if she follows the terms of her probation, that she can avoid jail time. So she did plead guilty and there could be many reasons why, you know, if they were fighting to get the case dismissed. I mean, especially cases like this, it could run for years and probably the cost of even having an attorney or a lawyer for that long is super expensive and a lot of people just give up and take the plea deal because if you also don't take the plea deal and you're found guilty your punishment could be even worse recently in Massachusetts they proposed a bill that criminalizes suicide coercion so anyone who coerces or encourages individual to self-harm can be convicted and punished to jail time for up to five years called the Conrad law now whatever you say could impact someone immensely your words are very important just like your actions. So I have a little personal story that kind of contributes to my little two cents and I know a personal, and this person that I know was dating a significant someone. But in this case, this person that I know was the best person they can be for their significant other. You know, it wasn't a toxic relationship. They were trying to be the most supportive, you know, loving partner they can at their very young age they were in. Now, unfortunately, the person that I know significant other also ended up self-harming themselves and ended up passing away. Now, during their relationship, I did hear that the significant other would also send a lot of threats that they're going to self-harm themselves. And I've seen ones where, you know, I felt like this person was possibly dealing with certain mental conditions that they weren't diagnosed with. So it made me think, well, if this person that I knew was the opposite and was, you know, very negative, very toxic, would that have also affected the outcome? Because the person that I know tried to be the best they can, but still ended up having their significant other self-harming themselves. And it made me think maybe it wouldn't have affected the outcome and that this person really needed just the professional help that they could get. Of course, I'm not comparing this story to today's case at all because everything is case by case and what we can learn from today's case is that you know if you know someone that's dealing I think it's important to encourage them to get professional help in conclusion I think in this case they both needed serious help and your words are so important because they can and will manifest into the physical reality I would like to know what you guys have thought about this case when you're commenting please be mature I will delete any comments that is attacking having profanity and remember, do not be afraid to seek help. I seeked help when I was dealing with my severe anxiety and it's the best decision that I've made because these days we have a lot of technology that we also can get help from. You don't have to go somewhere physically or seem like it's impossible to get help. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in my next video. 
many of you guys have talked to cops or police before in your life? Was it a good experience, bad experience? Have any of them made you feel uncomfortable in a way like they're supposed to be protecting you but they're actually breaking the law? Today we're going to be talking about Daniel Holtz Club's controversial case. Is this a cop really innocent or guilty? This is a really confusing case and it really gets you to double think about why finding exact legitimate evidence is so important when it comes to convicting someone. Is this an innocent man that was just put into life in prison or is he a evil dirty cop? I am so torn between the evidences. I am 50-50 so I need your help finding out what exactly could have happened. Again, a little disclaimer, I'm still healing from my wisdom teeth. It's been like over two weeks now. My right side was a big surgery and I still feel like my bones are all broken down right here like this is Daniel Holt's claw. He is half Japanese, half American. He was born on December 10th, 1986 and was only 26 years old at the time. His father was also a lieutenant and I also believe his mother worked in the law enforcement. His whole family was really big in that department. He was a big guy. He was six foot one. He had broad shoulders. He was a football player back in high school and he wanted to play for the NFL, but when he didn't make it, he decided to join his second choice in career, which was criminal justice. As you can see, this is a big guy. He went to the gym a lot. He took a lot of muscle enhancements. I mean, he was huge. And that's how he met his girlfriend, bonding over their love for physical health. Both of them attended church every week, and he was described as a good, kind-hearted Christian boy. And although he was a big guy, they describe him as this like big, soft teddy bear. All his classmates, teammates, past relationships, everyone did describe him to be a very quiet, kind guy. The trouble started sometime around June 2014 when it was the end of his shift but he decided to make a traffic stop. Number one, the strange thing was that his shift ended like I said but he decided to pull someone over and technically do some more work. Second weird thing was that he turned off all his computer system inside the police car. Apparently there is a computer system inside the car where you could look people war up for warrants, run car tags, the GPS system that's inside the car that shows the police department where the police car traveled at all times. He claims that he does this sometimes, you know, when his shift ends. Um, some police people do that, some don't. Apparently, he's supposed to keep it on for 24 7. I'm not sure. I'm not a police. The person that he stopped was a woman named Janie Liggins. She was a 57 year old grandmother who ran a daycare. Daniel claims that she was swerving the road and he was concerned as there might be something wrong with the driver being drunk, you know, under the influence. When he stopped her, he did pat her down and she admitted to have smoked marijuana. It was only two hours there when this woman would go inside the police department to file a report that a police officer has sexually harassed her. Details of what happened to her, I'm not going to see into the video. I'll put some links down if you want to see more specific details, but she was SA. She claimed she was afraid for her life and begged the police officer to stop. The police department soon found out that it was Daniel Holzclaw that stopped this woman that day. He also never reported the stop to the department, which you're supposed to do, I heard. I don't know how common this is to not report your stop. Stops, but supposedly they say this is against the police department rules. So he was put into an interrogation room and they started interviewing him to see what was the truth and if this really happened. And if it did, I mean, it's disgusting that a police officer would do this to random normal civilians. Daniel denied everything and he claims that he usually turns off his computer in the car after his shift. After petting down Janie, he says that he just warned her about safe driving and let her go. He did say that she was very nervous, you know, saying that maybe he will shoot her. You know, he told her to calm down and everything is all right. You see my concern here. I'm just listening to you, sir. I know, but I'd rather listen to you and you start talking. That's all I have, sir. We can get skin cells. We can get and do all that and still get DNA. Right. We can fall on the sword okay. and say I screwed up or something, but if we say we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, and then the DNA comes back and says he did it, then we have a huge problem. Right. We're here to give you the chance to fall on the sword so we don't, we don't want a huge problem. We don't want a huge problem for you. Right. 
it's this is time it's time if you're if it touched her mouth if it touched the inside of her mouth for one second two seconds three seconds you got to tell us now look there's there's a huge difference there's a huge difference in between a uh, right being forced mm -hmm. and some and, old girl who yeah. wants it right. okay we've had plenty of that we, right. we, we get that right. we know that okay but there is there is there is a big difference okay right. so I'm, I'm sticking with my story I'm, I'm okay <laughs> okay on the video are we gonna see her you shouldn't see her boobs I didn't see her boobs okay. are we gonna see her pull her pants down I didn't see her pull her pants down Ultimately, he denied everything that Janie told the police about the harassment, including Janie claiming that the police officer made her lift her shirt up. But at the end of the interrogation, they stripped him of his clothes just in case there would be any evidence. This interrogation has been a bit of a hot debate because if you see Daniel's responses to these incriminating, like shocking accusations, he's surprisingly very calm. According to the interrogator and some people, they believe that if you've been accused of something that you didn't do, especially like SA or a high criminal charge, I mean, you would kind of get angry. The other girl that he's talking about is kind of making the same allegations and that's, that's weird. Yeah, that's doesn't look good. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's doesn't look, yeah, that's doesn't look good. So, no, I don't. No one with the city rescue mission. Never been asked. Never been offered anyone to go there. Um, do you give people rides sometimes? I do give people rides. Do you? I do. Because sometimes I'd be like, I am not a taxi cab. I'll go but. Rides. You would have a bit more emotions than how Daniel did. The interrogator described Daniel as a robot. He had zero emotions. You know, honestly, like I've talked to the police before and whenever they were asking me or trying to accuse me of something, I was very calm and collected. Like I didn't get angry. I just said, no, I didn't do it. And I am the type to be a bit more calm when it comes to that. And Daniel was in the police enforcement. So maybe that's one of the reasons why he acted that way. And everyone's personality is different but it is odd that he was so calm and collected with these crazy accusations police found an unknown female dna inside of daniel's pants they didn't know who this was and they believed that there had to be more victims so they decided to get the list of all the females that daniel searched or he came into contact with so they came up with this target list which was african-american women mostly in poverty and was in trouble with the law such as having warrants out addictions and etc they believe that he targeted these women specifically because they were easy targets they wouldn't speak out against an officer and in exchange for favors they would not be arrested so this is what the police believed Daniel was doing. They went door to door to find these women who could have been potential victims. And actually, many of the women came forward to say that indeed they have been assaulted by a police officer. Another woman who came forward says that she was taken to a hospital by Daniel due to drugs. And while she was cuffed to the hospital bed, that's when she was SA'd. Another really strange thing is, after this incident, Daniel friended this woman on Facebook. And there's a chat log actually of him asking if everything was okay, asking her for her number to see if they could call, um, which was super odd. Police officer friending you on Facebook and asking if you were okay and your phone number. It did not look good for him. It was also proven that Daniel went to this victim's house in his personal car in his quote to check up on her. It's a little bit crossing the line in my opinion, but what do you guys think? Although Daniel claims that he was just trying to be a good police officer because during this incident she was telling him about, you know, the hard life that she had so he felt a little bit of, you know, sympathy towards her and wanted to see if she was okay being an extra good cop, I guess. And phone call records show that the calls were only for about five seconds, which they believe Daniel called her but she never picked up. So the victim claimed that he was being very sexual with her during the phone calls and she was very uncomfortable but that he wasn't doing it on the chats obviously so that you know there would be no evidences kept but again they found that the call logs were only about five seconds meaning they really did not talk to each other on the phone more women from the list came forward and in total there were about 21 accusers all with similar stories so this is when the very controversial 
evidences come about. Of the 21 accusers, about eight were eliminated because they were deemed to be not credible, and some even admitted that they were lying. Another woman who was being interviewed by the police when they asked her, have you ever been inappropriately touched by a police officer? She clearly says no multiple times. But later on, she came forward changing her story to yes, I have been assaulted by a police officer. She described this officer as someone with a light skin like a Mexican and in his late 30s. Another woman who described the officer as black male and short, which also did not match the description of Daniel. And the lady who claims that she was friended by Daniel on Facebook. She was seen after the interview saying, so is this good evidence? Even if he did not rape nobody, he still came in contact. It's an odd thing for a victim to say, is this good evidence? Even if he didn't do something, like this is a big accusation. Something you wouldn't think a victim would ever say. So could all these women be really lying? Daniel's family and the defense believe that the reason why they were lying was because the interrogators might have approached the woman as, we will take care of your warrants or whatever trouble you're in if you cooperate with us and give us a little bit more information. Remember, all these women got in trouble with the law. They had warrants out, they were being arrested, and maybe it was something that they used to try and get something out of it. There was also a lot more shaky evidences, such as the grandmother Janie. At first, when she was interrogated, she claimed that the officer was blonde and was about 5'7 to 5'9 in height and didn't have a smooth skin. One of the key evidence that the prosecutor claim is that Janie was the only one from the list that did not have a warrant or was in trouble with the law. She had no motive to lie about her story. The fact that people could not find a motive that she would lie convinced a lot of people that she might be telling the truth. Another woman who actually testified under the influence of drugs. Nobody knows how and why this woman was allowed to testify under the influence, but it did happen. Also, that DNA that was found in Daniel's pants, the prosecutor strongly argued that it came from a 17-year-old female victim and it was proven to be skin DNA from private parts. But after the trial, it was slowly revealed that there's actually no test that's being done pretty much anywhere to prove which skin DNA it's from, like which part of the body it's from, and that the prosecutors did not have this technology and this was a lie in court. Let's go back to the interrogation tape. Remember when he was stripped of his badges and his clothing? Contrary to what a lot of women claimed of having his private parts out from the zipper of his pants, you could see that he was wearing a very tight no hole no zipper undergarments along with other garments underneath that was not so easy for him to take off because all the women were claiming that the zipper was down and his private parts were just sticking out some of the women swore that he came to their house assaulted them stole things from their house and there were no dna found linking daniel to any of these accusations prosecutors argued that from every story of these women his gps system correctly matched where they were. So prosecutors obviously argued that he was there and this happened because the GPS does not lie. But the defense argued that of course he was there. He did come into contact with some of these women because it was his job. But the GPS also showed that the car never made long-term stops in these areas where he was being accused from. But what about the DNA from that 17 year old victim? Defense argued that the amount of DNA collected was just the amount of like like any other touch DNA. Touch DNA is something that you could transfer by just touching someone's items such as bags or patting their clothes down and then you touch your other part of the clothing or you go to the bathroom and that's how that DNA got on his pants. There was also two unknown male DNA found in his pants, which defense also argued that this clearly shows that it's touch DNA and you could get anyone's DNA by touching pretty much anything. During the court cases, there were a lot of people that wanted to put Daniel in jail and thought that he was really guilty. And according to some people, this was used to intimidate the juries and kind of, you know, use that mob mentality. Defense and Daniel thought that they did have a strong case because there were so many conflicting evidences, but eventually he was convicted of the eight of the 13 cases and sentenced to 260 
three years in jail. Minus the one DNA evidence, all was just a victim's worst against his. His reaction to the sentencing went viral on social media. Is this reaction of a man being so guilty? Or is this a reaction of an innocent man being sentenced to life in jail? Daniel in prison still denies that he had done any wrongdoings and all of these women were lying and that the police, that they were out there to hunt something and they pretty much found everything that tried to fit into the narrative. Some say that it's because, you know, there were police officers that were actually guilty of doing this and they wanted to throw Daniel, who was a 26 year old rookie police officer under the bus so they don't get caught. Families also believe that the victims lied for a big paycheck because now there is a civil lawsuit for the victims and you know, if they win, they could get a lot of compensation money. To the victims, this was a horrifying day of a cop abusing his power and specifically targeting a group of women that they knew that would not speak out. It is odd that he would turn off his system, but again, you know, we're not police officers. Maybe many police officers do this. Maybe some don't. Maybe he was doing something shady, not specifically to what he was accused of, but he was just he was just doing something else shady and he just got a huge bad luck. Regardless, a lot of people still believe that rather he's innocent or guilty based on the evidences, he should not have been convicted, especially 263 years. And I completely agree with that. Rather he's innocent or guilty, that's up to him and the victims that only know. The fact that the evidences were so weak. It just disturbs a lot of people the fact that you convict someone with such shaky evidences. The latest update was that the US Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal of Daniel Holtzclaw's case. Let me know what you guys have thought. There were so much more information that I could not fit into this video. There's hours and hours of information. I just could not put it into this video. I just try to sum it up as much as I can. So check all those links down below. Come back to this video and let me know what you have have thoughts about this case. Thank you so much for watching and your like in this video helps to spread words about these cases. And I reply to all my early birds if you put on the notification bell. Thank you so much for watching.